gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please take your. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please take your seats. That means you, David. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And welcome to the Fan District Association sponsored debate between the candidates for the second and fifth district of Richmond City Council. This neighborhood, the Fan neighborhood, spans portions of both the second and the fifth district, and that is why we're hearing from both candidates candidates for both districts. My name is Roger Whitfield and I'm the president of the Fan District Association. I want to thank Daniela Jacobs, I believe he's here, over at the back there, the headmistress of Fox School, Fox Elementary School, for allowing us to use this uh, very fine facility. And to Rob Winslow, one of her teachers, for getting things set up for us. I also want to thank the Fan District Association Committee that organized this debate. And if you guys would please stand as I call your name. Bill Montgomery is the chair of our committee. Laura Bateman, she's up at the back there. Matthew Stanley, Matthew, and Ted Theophilus. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there are any significant guests here this evening. We don't have the mayor or the president or anybody like that, I guess. <laughs> um, look, there's one thing I, I need to be very clear about, and that is that the Fan District Association does not endorse any candidates. We're hosting these debates, and yesterday we heard from the school board candidates, because we see part of our mission to encourage a healthy exchange ideas among our residents. We're a civic association and we want to provide the opportunity for our residents to become engaged and informed as they make their own decisions like the polls on November the 6th. We have an independent moderator for this debate. For this debate we're privileged to have Mr. Ryan Knowles. Ryan, if you would please come up. familiar face to many of you. He's the anchor of NBC 12 News at 4, NBC 12 News at 5.30, and Fox Richmond's News at 10. He's a general assignment reporter, but with a focus on politics and government. He received his bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Rockport, and a master's in public administration from the Rockefeller School at the State University of New York, Albany. The Washington Post has named him as one of America's best state-based political reporters. Welcome and thank you, Ryan. Thank you. You've submitted many questions for the candidates, uh, by, by, mostly by email. They have been given to Ryan and he has reviewed them and selected uh, about eight to ten of them that in his opinion are the most pertinent. He will explain the debating procedure just before the debate begins. NBC 12 will also be taping this, these proceedings. The FDA thanks the candidates for agreeing to participate. They have brought campaign literature, which is out at the back, and we also have copies of statements that they made for Fanfare, which is our bi-monthly newsletter, which you can also pick up at the back. In the interest of not coloring your view of the candidates, I'll give you a short and uniform biography of each of them as they come up onto the stage, and I'll pull them up. They will come up in alphabetical order. At the end of the debate, the candidates will be allowed to make a two-minute statement. The order was determined by choosing straws, and uh, I believe, Brian, you have that, uh, that order. It actually turns out, if you don't know, it is, it is in alphabetical order. It is in the order in which they will sit. If I forget, they can just wrestle off. Is that okay? Wrestle <laughs> off. 
right? Okay. There are two segments. The first segment will be 45 minutes and we'll hear from the candidates from the 5th district. And after a short intermission, we'll hear from the candidates from the 2nd district. Okay, well, let me get started with the 5th district debate. The candidates, uh, I'll introduce them, I'll give you a quick biography of them. The first candidate is Parker Agilastro. Parker, come up please. Thirty-six years old, he is a museum consultant, and he is also on the adjunct, adjunct faculty of the University of Virginia. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Bates College, and a Master of Arts in Art History and an MBA, both from the Darden Business School at the University of Virginia. He works in the community, and he is a member of the Fair District Association. The next candidate is Marty Jewell. Marty, if you <laughs> Marty is 67 years old. He is the owner of Total Home Care, his own business, uh, a residential cleaning service. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Virginia Union, and he is the incumbent councilman. The last candidate is Lee Shoemate. <laughs> Lee is 48. She is temporarily retired from running her own business consulting firm. She was in the 90s the executive director of Grace House, and uh, earlier than that, she worked for the Patrick Auto Group. Lee is a VCU graduate. She is the president of the Woodland Heights Civic Association and also president of the Friends of Forest Hill Park. So with that, let me turn over the proceedings to Ryan. All right. And let's give Roger a big hand. Thank you, Roger. I have to say, there's something about Roger reading my credentials in that wonderful accent that makes me seem a lot more impressive than I actually am. So thank you, Roger, for that. Uh, first of all, and let me all thank you for being out here tonight. And this is something incredible to see a group of people so engaged uh, and connected to their community. They take time out of their week, uh, a significant portion of the chunk of time, probably free time that you have with your family to be here tonight. So you, you all deserve uh, quite a bit of recognition for that. And also, I want to thank the candidates for being here as well. I was talking with some friends as we were coming in about the difficulty that you folks had getting your message out, given the fact that we have so many important elections this year, a race for president, a race for U.S. Senate, races for Congress. Uh, in, in a lot of respects, you folks are the folks that are on the front lines. And so it's difficult to get that message out when there's so much noise out there. Uh, and so you deserve a lot of credit, and, and being here is part of that tonight. Let me just briefly talk about how we're going to format the structure tonight. We're not going to have somebody with a, a bell that's going to ding two minutes, and uh, we're not going to have rebuttal time specifically. We're going to try to make this as much of a free-flowing discussion as we possibly can. It's going to be my responsibility to rein you in or let you go, depending on how that goes, and I will do my best to be fair. But also trying to respect each other as candidates. We'll give you each the opportunity to weigh in on every single issue and an opportunity to rebut if an accusation is made. But we're going to try and keep it going as fast as we possibly can so that we can touch on as many topics as possible. And I think each of you, Councilman, there's a, uh, a microphone right there that you'll hold uh, so that everybody can hear you. And then your role in this, which is important, if we can, as best as you can, try and not get engaged in what you're seeing up here. Uh, if the more uh, cheering or booing or cat calls that we have, the longer this process is going to take. So if you can uh, do your best to not have any kind of audible response to what you're hearing up here today, uh, we'll make this process go a lot quicker and it will also be fairer to the candidate. So if you could do me that favor, I'd appreciate it. And at the end of the day, if any of you call me Jim Lair, I don't know if I'll take that as a compliment, but we'll try and get through it as best we can. All right, so let's begin.
And, um, and, and, and I should also say that we'll close uh, with giving each candidate the opportunity to give a two-minute closing statement. But we're not going to start with opening statements. We're going to start right with questions. And uh, Parker, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, fan residents and residents of Richmond in general, I think, are, are concerned about infrastructure deterioration. They see sidewalks coming apart. They see streets in need of repairs. Potholes are already a big problem. Trees may be in difficult situations. Do you think that that's a priority? Would it be a priority for you as a councilman? And if so, how do you address that problem given the, given the lack of funding and some of the bureaucratic hurdles that uh, you would face in that situation? Sure. Um, it's definitely a, a major issue within our older neighborhoods like the Fan, uh, like Oregon Hill. Uh, we also have some of the newer neighborhoods on the south side of the river that have zero sidewalks, zero infrastructure uh, put in place. Uh, but up here, you know, we need to be doing a little bit better of having a rotational maintenance schedule. Too often what it is is we are calling and complaining and saying this needs to be done. We're not following a program to do maintenance on trees, to do maintenance on our sidewalks. Uh, we do have a huge backlog of uh, projects that need to be completed. It's very expensive, as you pointed out. Uh, but then we do, on the flip side of this, we have special projects that seem to be happening at very high price tags. I mean, just recently in the news, you saw that it cost $300,000 to pave an alleyway. You know, and you sit there and you think, gosh, $300,000 could have done a lot of sidewalk maintenance in other neighborhoods that really have more of a critical uh, safety concern when people are walking and tripping on tree roots and on bricks that have been misplaced. Uh, and yet our city has been allocating resources uh, to some of these other special projects. We do need to increase revenue in the city uh, so that we can start addressing that's this so timely. Mean, that's a code word. Does revenue mean taxes? Revenue when you say raise revenue, it's one of my bugaboos. I hear that yeah. all the time. Does revenue mean that we have to raise taxes? And if so, how do you do that? No. In fact, I support cutting the taxes where we can. I mean, the water rate, we should not be uh, charging the water rates that we're charging. Uh, what I'm encouraging is more of the economic development, finding opportunities where the city's revenues will increase based on new business, uh, based on more residents living in homes and paying property taxes, uh, not in terms of increasing the rate. Okay. All right, Councilman Jewell, your response to that. What can we do to improve the infrastructure in this community? Uh, let's start by recognizing that our city auditor that I declare to be the best auditor in America, uh, has reported that we have $271 million worth of road improvement and rebuilding needs. We only put $11 million in the budget this year. Uh, at that rate, uh, it, it'll be the next century before we get our road straight. Uh, and so yes, we need to up the priority on, on road improvement and sidewalks. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm fortunate, uh, don't ask me how, but I consider uh, those streets in my district some of the best in the city, though not anywhere near perfect, with the exception of north of the expressway. Those streets have been paved, carried, Main Street two, three times in the last five years, carried down. Uh, but it's the side streets on the north side of the expressway that has to get done. Uh, and, and we got to work at that. Uh, yes, we do need to Im increase our revenue streams. I took our chief uh, uh, operating officer down to Tri-Cities. We've got excess water capacity since Henrico County three, four years ago started uh, 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 treating their own water. They're treating and selling water, trying to sell it to Gucci, trying to sell it to government. Uh, but they've got water need down Tri-Cities. Uh, Lake Chesney, every summer, goes dry. It's a major reservoir for that area. Why are we selling them water? Well, lo and behold, I took them down there three years ago, just last November, they sold five million gallons of water to Chesterfield County, who feeds water down to the Tri-Cities. Uh, street lights. I've got a project in my district that has solar power street lights. It may be the only solar power street lights in the state of Virginia. We need to replicate that and replace all 32,000 city-owned street lights in the city at, at, with a million dollars a month, the million bill, we could reduce uh, uh, that bill 
down by 25% after you pay $10,000 uh, for 10 years, the deep pocket to upfront the cost, we will have 25% less electric bill for life. So, but you said $11 million is all we're investing in, in road projects. You said that the priority has to be changed. That would mean money's got to come from somewhere else. Obviously, you've got a couple of plants here selling water in some other areas. What are you going to cut in order to increase the funding that's going to go into road projects? If you've been reading the paper lately, Brian, you will know that Richmond is not hurting for money. <laughs> Richmond is not hurting for money. I agree. We need to find ways to reduce out some of these taxes. We've got tax rates based on when population left Richmond 15, 20 years ago. Uh, when corporate disinvested and redeployed those investments out into the counties, those investments are coming back into the city thanks to Jim Ucrop and those corporate leaders who, who uh, in the mid 90s start working to reverse that trend. And so we're not hurt. Uh, we put an unprecedented $97 million in the rainy day savings fund for some foolish idea of getting a triple-A bond rating when the bond raters have told us over and over again, you don't get triple-A until you cut your 27% poverty rate in half. There's nothing in the budget to reduce poverty. So, no, we're not hurting for money. We don't have to increase taxes. We need to shift the problems. Okay. All right. Uh, Lee, do you agree with that from your read of the budget that Richmond's not hurting for money? And if so, do you think that some of these investments should be made in infrastructure improvements? I would say that we're faring better than we have in the past. And certainly, there continues to be a great deal of waste. I mean, every time the auditor goes into a department, it's millions of dollars. So certainly, we should be doing more in infrastructure. The money is there. It needs to get slotted into the right areas. Uh, but having priced out with the city a lot of projects, what I find is that it is exorbitant the cost that they assign to installing one strip of sidewalk. Uh, I've poured a sidewalk. I know what it costs. And it doesn't cost $250,000 to run 60 feet of sidewalk. It just doesn't. So I think it might be time for us to explore utilizing outsourcing, partnering with nonprofits, running training programs. I think there's plenty of ways that we can address the infrastructure concerns uh, and do it in a budget-friendly way. A couple, I mean, and Councilman, you kind of alluded to this too, but I'm going to pose this question to you. Are you insinuating that perhaps there needs to be some change in some of the administrators in city government? Uh, I mean, if, if, the, if you feel that these projects are not being uh, appropriately uh, contracted out, does there need to be new directors in places making these decisions? Should, should that be reviewed? Is there anyone specific that you think needs to perhaps be reviewed? Well, I don't have anyone specific, but I certainly have concerns with some of the price tags that are being attached. And whether they're being attached simply to get citizens or neighborhood leaders to go away and stop asking for, for programs, or whether or not that's a legitimate price tag that they're assigning, we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, but if that's what it's actually costing, then there's a major malfunction somewhere. All right, I, Councilman, I'm going to go to you now. And you, the quote you just said was that you're not hurting for money. The city's not hurting for money. But the public school system has a pretty significant budget shortfall, $23 million in this next year. If the city's not hurting for money, how much of this money should be going to help out in many respects, some schools that are in serious trouble. Um, glad you asked. I, I'm one of three who voted three times for amendments to increase the school budget. Perhaps not to the full 23 million, 24 million dollars. Uh, we did increase it by 11 and a half million dollars. That covered uh, uh, retirement fund and it covered health uh, premiums. Uh, but again, uh, as a percentage of our budget compared to our neighboring localities, we're still below. Yes, per pupil, we're spending a lot of money overall, $13,000 per child. Most of that is federal money, Title I money, and all these other dollars, uh, lottery money and state money and everything else that comes down. Uh, but that aside, uh, 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 the school system did not sell their increase well 
They needed additional money. They went five years flat funded and didn't make a squeak. All of a sudden, they need 24 million new dollars. Well, I'm convinced they had a templated budget for the last 10 years. They were too darn lazy to actually do a needs budget. And as a consequence, they woke up one day and said, oh, we got these needs. Well, that's not the way to do business. Um, and they didn't sell it. Council majority didn't give it to them, but I did support that they have additional dollars. So part of the dollars are there. The dollars are there. Look, we found out the first week in April from this audit that the city finance department failed to audit, build, and collect $15 million, like they forgot, of commercial personal property tax. They sweat us individually for our individual personal property tax. How could you not bill $15 million? Just two weeks ago, we saw $6.8 million of, of uh, stormwater uh, fees that weren't collected. And the mayor said, don't collect it. What he really means is don't collect them until after the election. <laughs> Well, let's not get off. I don't get off on too many topics. I want to stay here on schools, Parker. Uh, the councilman argues that basically the school district has not made the case to get additional funding. Do you agree with that? And if that is the case, how do you solve that problem to put them in a position where they could utilize this supposed excess money? Right. So uh, one of the things that I think failed was uh, working together with city council and our school board. You know, if if as Councilman Jewell is pointing out, you know, they didn't sell it. Well, you weren't knocking on the door asking for more information on how could you support their budget. So I think it needs to become more of a collaboration so that we're working together uh, to make sure that our schools are fully funded. Uh, what I'm hearing, and it, it kind of upsets me, is because the school board didn't do its work, let's penalize the schools. You know, we can't penalize our youth, and withholding funding is not a good option. Uh, I think if, if we wanted to make a statement in terms of our funding, we could have still fully funded the schools by simply allocating the remaining money into the Richmond Public School Foundation so that the money is still earmarked for a future date that the schools could then come and tap it. Uh, I, don't, I just don't think underfunding our schools is a smart idea. How about you, uh, Lee Wayne, on this? Well, I agree with, with both of them, but I'll go in a little bit different direction. Hands down, I don't care where you are in the city, people are talking about schools and improving schools. Yes, I can see that the school board has been lazy budget-wise. They floated along for years and they didn't sell it. But council members are listening to you. And you all have clearly been saying there's an issue with schools. So I have an issue with council. And I think where it comes down to is are you going to be a rubber stamp for the budget that comes from the mayor's office? Or are you going to truly vet those budgets? And that's what is not happening. The mayor is charged with crafting the budget, yes. Council passes it, and council can amend it as it sees fit. And I see that happening for special interest projects. It should have happened with the school. So you're saying that the school budget, I mean the school board, puts forward, the superintendent puts forward their budget, then the school board approves it, the mayor takes a look at it. You're saying the mayor should be getting in more into the guts of the actual school budget before just passing it along to city council. Well, the mayor should, but if the mayor fails to do that, that's why city council is there. I mean, it's, it's a checks and balance system. If the mayor's budget is out of line with the priorities of the people, then it's, a, it's on the council members to bring that budget back into line to reflect what the people want done with the money. So, Councilman Jewell, they both basically accused your city council of not doing enough to work with the schools to improve. <laughs> They're absolutely right, which is just my point. You made my point. There were three of us who voted yes to increase uh, uh, the budget through three amendments. One was indeed through the uh, uh, Richmond Education Foundation. They were voted down by the other six over and over again because, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, the mayor had two public hearings with his task force on school budget. Mr. Henderson got in his face and insulted him twice. The first time he let him, let him go, the second time he went and clicked. That was five weeks out from council voting on that budget. The six on council did not budge towards increasing that for five weeks 
and it was clear they were acceding to the wishes of the mayor. And so because of a personal slight, 22,000 children did not get full funding. Parker, did you want to make a point there? Yeah, the point that I wanted to ask of Councilman Jewell is, have you actually sat down with the 5th District School Board representative and talked through the budget and talked through the issues in our schools? Because, you know, we are hearing from the residents that we have concerns in our schools and we want to see improvements, but if you're not working together, how are you going to make that well, change? Let me rephrase the question a bit, Parker, and ask you this, Councilman. Do you think it's your responsibility as a member of council to sit in with a school board member who has a constitutional responsibility to craft that budget and look at it line by line before you vote on it in council? And should you be working with the school board on that kind of very micro level before it gets to you and, and then it gets into the politics of the at city council? every chance, council should be working with his district school board member. I assisted in getting this gentleman appointed. Uh, when Ms. Carr went to uh, Phil Frank Hall's seat in the General Assembly. I cleared the field for him to be appointed. And from that point on, he's never, uh, we've met six times. I've asked for every meeting. I've invited him to be a part of my quarterly district meetings. Um, and he's been there most of the time. He's never called a district meeting on school. And he has never asked me to sit down and meet with him. And so I don't know what he was doing out there. All I know is he, he decided to distance himself from me, for whatever reason. But I'm amazed that Mr. Parker would raise these issues when, A, he's been a member of the Fan District Association. He's never been seen in our district until June the 12th, when, which was the filing deadline, which is when he began coming to district meetings over in the 5th District. Praise the Lord. And so, I'm just curious to know what you could possibly know about that if you've not been active in the district. I've never seen him at a PTA meeting. Okay, I've never seen him at a civic meeting. Let's give Parker the, uh, right. the chance to respond to this. He's saying that you haven't been engaged enough in, in fifth district issues. How would you respond to that? Uh, I think the councilman doesn't understand where the boundaries of the fifth district are. You know, at one point I approached you, I said, I want to work with you. 2006, I sent you emails. I never heard a word one back from you. I'm trying to get engaged in city government. I'm trying to get engaged in the community. But if your city council member turns a deaf ear to you, how can you get engaged? And one time when I actually approached you in person, Mr. Jewell, you said, Floyd Avenue's not in the 5th District. I never told you uh, You know, and, and you say that the FDA is not part of the 5th District. I'm sorry, but it is. That's why we're here tonight with the Fan District Association, because there is a part of the 5th District that falls within this neighborhood association, and I am involved. Just for clarity, Floyd Avenue is in the 5th District, but only the south half of it. The other is in the second. The middle of that street is a divided one. Never seen him. Okay. Glad you showed up. <laughs> All right, we're not going to get any further into that. Now, Lee, uh, I do want to expand on this issue uh, because I think there is a broader issue to have when it comes to schools, and it's kind of something I was trying to unpack here a little bit about the role the mayor has in this responsibility. And, and I really want to make sure that we understand that there is a clear constitutional distinction between the responsibilities of the superintendent, the school board, and the city council. Do you think that the mayor should have more responsibility when it comes to the crafting of the schools and the and the administration of the schools. It's something of obviously, famously, Governor Wilder uh, at one point tried to invoke. Is this something Mayor Jones and council members should be pushing for? Should the city council and the mayor have a bit more control over it? So does it get to this point where it's only once you get to the budget that you have some sort of say? I don't know if control is the proper term. I think there's some kind of a disconnect that's happening when the school board is coming back with a figure that much over what has been put into the mayor's budget. And then you have this brawl taking place over public education dollars. I'm not a fan of micromanagement when people are doing a good job. We have significant issues with our schools. And at that point, someone needs to do some oversight work. 
whether that involves replacing leadership, whether that involves sitting down person to person and working directly between council members and school board, but we have issues and that our children, our future, are paying the price for that. So someone needs to be in charge and lead us out of the mess. Should, should the mayor have more power, Parker? Should the mayor have direct oversight? Should he be able to maybe just, for instance, hire and fire the superintendent? Should that be his responsibility? No, I think we do have a shared responsibility in, in our government. I mean, we, we've, it's a new form here in Richmond uh, since Doug Wilder became the first of our stronger mayors. Uh, and we have to work together. You know, I don't think we want to continue to give excessive authority to our mayor. We need to start having a little bit more say so in the process. I think one of the biggest challenges is communication uh, because I think so often what happens is people want to talk and work through their situation, their problem, and come to a reasonable conclusion together uh, and we just aren't engaging in that dialogue. And uh, Councilman, I'll let you have the last word on that. Do you think the mayor should have more responsibility when it comes to the administration of the school district? The uh the council can only have influence with schools through budget. Right, and that, that's what I'm asking. Should there be but, more? But, but the mayor has the ability to take that lump sum and fund schools by categories. I pleaded with him to do that this past year because things were so discombobulated that there could be some control, not a lot, but some control when you put X number of dollars in administration uh, and that's the ceiling. When you put X number of dollars in instruction, X number of dollars in career development, X number of dollars in extracurricular activity, uh, at least he can sort of level out those dollars and not allow schools on its own volition to rob Peter and pay Paul. And so uh, uh, I, I think funding by categories is a way that the mayor has a, the legislative ability, the legal ability, I, I should say, to in fact have greater control over schools, and he didn't do it. All right, so let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Nice discussion on schools, though. Thank you for that. And talk about the Washington Redskins. And uh, the Redskins, who in my opinion as a Buffalo Bills fan are just an awful, awful football team. <laughs> Broke my heart on two different occasions. Uh, but the Redskins obviously have decided to come here to Richmond uh, to have hold their training camp. And this uniquely impacts the 5th and the 2nd District in two different ways because two of the sites that they're looking at reside in another district. One of them, of course, is City Stadium, which would be in your districts. Lee, do you think it's a good idea for the Redskins to take over City Stadium? Do you think that's the best utilization for that really important area of real estate that right now doesn't have too much activity? You know, I, it's an interesting location because it's surrounded by residential. And I, while I think the Redskins are a good idea, I have some qualms. Um, if the residents really understand the impact that's going to happen, um, I, I know a couple of people that actually go to their training camp now, and they attract thousands of people, sometimes upwards of 5,000 people. And as we know in Richmond, all of those 5,000 people will be in cars that have to park somewhere. Um, so I think, while it's, it's a good idea, and I think it's a good use, I do think we have to be careful that the details in the planning are laid out, and that the community is involved, and that their input is taken into consideration. Uh, Councilman, you've obviously been heavily involved in these discussions. Is City Stadium the place you think the Redskins should be? Absolutely, yes. Uh, that was uh, redounded uh, uh, several times by a full house uh, of residents who live in that area, who live in the Carolina, who live in the stadium area. Uh, uh, they wanted to remain a stadium. They love to have the Redskins. They love to have anybody playing it. It's foolish to have a venue of this nature to be so totally mismanaged for so many decades. It's idiocy. Uh, the, the, the city hires uh, SMG to manage the Coliseum, lose up, we're not making money off of it. They hire uh, uh, the same people to run the performing arts, we're losing money on that. 
the, 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 the dilemma is the only profitable uh, venue that's making money. Uh, the stadium is a venue. Why aren't we having professional management of it? And with regards to the Redskins, there's no big impact when they're only going to be here for three weeks. Uh, meanwhile, we need to get our children in there. TJ High School, the, uh, I just put $150,000 in, in, in this year's budget to upgrade their field. They got bleachers, no lights. George West, which is in our district, has lights, no bleachers. That's no way to treat children. And so if we're going to do this stuff, we need to do it right. And that's not been done right. And so do you, do you think the council person, you or whoever is elected, should actively be at, because, you know, it's down to two spots. Are you going to go out there and, and actively uh, uh, recruit and say, this is where we should put it, City Stadium, and lay that out? Is that your responsibility? Everybody who paid attention knows that the overwhelming majority of residents in that area want to keep it as a stadium and would love to have the Redskins there to use the facility and bring revenue to the city at the same time. Some $12 million a year, and they're trying to get private money to juice this $10 million that we just heard about three, three weeks ago. Uh, uh, we didn't know it had a $10 million price tag. Uh, but nonetheless, we can get private money to pay that. They generate $12 million a year that comes to the taxpayers. What about you, Parker? What's your take on the Redskins at City Stadium? I certainly believe that the, uh, the council member of the 5th District needs to be the advocate for the site. You know, I don't think we've really been doing a good enough job of engaging our community and making sure that their vision is, is outlined. With the Redskins specifically, I think, yes, as Councilman Jewell points out, people want to see the stadium exist as a stadium. However, there's been no impact plan presented to the community. So the community is still without knowledge. They don't know. There's been a lack of communication coming to the residents to say, this is what's going to happen. We have to make all these adjustments to the site in order to accommodate the Washington Redskins. The Bayers put $400,000 in the budget for the stadium, and, and it's going to cost more to make it for an NFL training site. Uh, there's going to be demolition. There's going to be additional playing fields, additional uh, facilities that are required. And I think certainly the council members should be part of the conversation, but also driving the conversation to make sure that residents are on board, make sure that Tarrytown is on board. Uh, but at the same time, the contract with the Washington Redskins is signed for eight years. We have to start putting in place a plan for what is the long-term use of the stadium. One of the things that our council failed to do was we knew that the University of Richmond was leaving the stadium. We did not effectively manage that relationship so that when they left, we had a plan in place on how and what we were going to do with the stadium. And I think we failed there, and we need to make sure we don't fail again when the Washington Redskin contract ends. Okay, uh, let's move on to another topic. And uh, Councilman, we'll start with you on this question. Uh, a pretty heated debate uh, in this city a couple of months ago when a local restaurant owner started a, a mini campaign to eliminate the 6% sales tax uh, at local eateries. You've said a couple of times tonight that the city's got plenty of money. Is it time to get rid of this 6% restaurant sales tax? We, we are not, I'm glad you asked that question. We are not a wash the money. Let's not get carried away. <laughs> so, so there's a difference, just to get you out of this, there's a difference between having plenty of money and being a wash the money. We, we, ain't heard, we ain't heard like so many municipalities around us. Uh, but I can say that, uh, yes, we need to revisit all of our taxes and fee structures uh, that were set by and large uh, some 15, 20 years ago when there was this mass exodus out of this city, uh, when corporate disinvested in this city, and we had uh, and redeployed their investments out in Enrico, Chesterfield, Hanover. Uh, corporate built Regency Mall. Corporate built most of those subdivisions out of Western Enrico. Corporate built in Innsbruck. And so they now have as much loyalty to those areas as they used to have to the city. Uh, uh, nonetheless, Jim Ucrop and that group led uh, uh, a reverse back to, uh, uh, to investing in this city. We're not there 100%, but at least we aren't bleeding like we were. 
our, our tax abatement program that was started. Man, I don't want to get. I want to. I want to. I'm trying to tell you, we got money rolling in. All but of the meals tax is what I really want. I mean, if you saw this, we I'm can trying to answer that. your question. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll make it quicker. The tax abatement program, those properties are maturing. They're coming on the tax roll exponentially. Uh, there's 60 percent of the auditor's findings of deficiencies still have not been reconciled by the administration. You fix that, you've got millions of dollars of savings. We are hurting. We ought to rethink the rate base of our taxes. Our meals tax at 6% is ridiculous. We at least ought to consider cutting it in half. We're chasing customers to the county. And so, but you you're got just, but the fees. We only get six hundred thousand. Your point is, you can't just eliminate that fee. You've got to take a look at everything first before you just come in and. It needs it to be considered. Reduce these okay. taxes and fees. All right, Parker. Is it? Uh, do you? What's your stance on this? The six percent meals tax should it stay or should it go? I think it should go. Uh, I think completely six percent. Uh, I think it should be reduced. You know, essentially, what what the commitments were made uh, were for center stage. Uh, as center stage has uh, been completed, uh, the council has agreed to reduce the rate. Uh, we just haven't actually implemented that, you know, what has already been agreed to. Uh, in the 5th district, which covers Carytown and Uptown, we have some of the most restaurants in the city that people are coming into the city from surrounding counties and spending their money here. So the representative of the 5th district should have the interest of our local business owners in mind in making sure that we're offering them the support that they need, and certainly reducing the meals tax is one of the ways that we can support our local restaurant tours. But Lee, that's a, a really uh, significant revenue stream. I mean, I asked the mayor about this on live television, and he said it was a, a stream of money the city can't go without. If, 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 and I'm not saying that I shouldn't put words in your mouth, first tell me if you think it's a good idea to reduce it or eliminate that tax, and if so, where are you gonna make up that money in other places? areas which we've already talked about is focusing on this rainy day fund for bond rating that is not going to happen. The fastest way to lower the level of poverty is to increase those residents who are not dealing with poverty. We're not able to do that if we can't offer solid infrastructure, solid schools, and the businesses that they want to visit as residents. The meals tax, all the taxes, yes, need to be done, and I've said this for years. We are surrounded by counties that are 15 minutes away. If we cannot be competitive across the board, and that's with everything, we've been hearing, all of us, all of us have heard from the police, from the fire, we haven't gotten raises. We're looking at the counties. We're looking at going to the counties. All of these rates have got to become in line, at least, with the counties. That's going to put us on a level playing field. That's going to help attract people to our area instead of pushing them. Right now, on average, we all pay all the fees added up, five to $6,000 more a year to live here as opposed to living 15 minutes away. That's why there's only 204,000 of us instead of five or 600,000 of us. Other urban areas that have cinched that belt, gotten their taxes down, have seen huge increases, upwards of 20 or 30% in their <coughs> urban renewal programs. We've just got to do it. We've got to be competitive. Okay. All right. We've come now to uh, our closing statements, and so please, uh, if you can get it, flies by, right? Time, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, and uh, we uh, are going to give each two minutes, and I'm going to try and keep you as close as I can to that time, so um, keep that in mind as you begin, but we're going to begin uh, with Parker, your closing statement for two minutes. So we'll just stay seated. Um, yeah, stay seated. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm Parker Agilasto. I live on Floyd Avenue in the neighborhood, and essentially what I'm offering on city council is somebody who's going to be responsive. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can send our council member emails and ask to make appointments and call, and you just don't get a response. That is the lack of representation that the 5th District currently experiences that I'm offering for a new voice and a new representation. At the same time, uh, I think we need to be working together again. We've got too many of our neighborhoods uh, that are losing young families uh, to the counties. And what happens is we end up with more rental properties. Uh, we are too transient. Uh, the FAN knows this. Oregon Hill knows this. Randolph and Maymont are beginning to experience this. We are having a crisis in the city in terms of keeping long-term residents, and we have to reverse that trend. The best way that I know how to reverse that trend is to attract more young families and keeping them here in the city by improving the quality of our education. We need to make sure that our public schools are the best that they can be so that we are competitive. Uh, the only way that we can address poverty, unemployment, and crime is if we start to make sure that everybody has opportunity. Uh, without opportunity, we end up with a higher tax burden on social services. Uh, so I'm proposing that we do a better job at uh, vocational training for our youth, better opportunities in terms of small, uh, growing small businesses and developing entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got Carytown, we've got Uptown. These are incredible assets for the 5th District. At the same time, the 5th District is really the parks district. It's got 500 acres of parkland. Uh, we are a huge attraction for visitors coming in from out of, uh, out of the city. And I think we need to have a representative who's better attuned to the parks, who's going to actually be working with our communities to make sure that our parks get the resources that they need. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. You can clap. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marty Jewell, and not only do I ask for your vote, I ask for your prayers. Uh, uh, we got a tough slog. This is an economy, an economic environment unlike anything any of us living knows anything about. Uh, the walks and whiffles uh, throughout this economy affect people every single day, up one day and down the next. Uh, and so, when times get like these, it's time to get A, creative, and B, close. Uh, it does take a village to raise a child. Those of us 40 years old and older know what I'm talking about. We were raised by that village. Sadly, the village has been broke for the last 25 years, and it's being reflected uh, uh, in our school system, in our youth culture, and we've got to fix it now. I'm launching a, 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 after this election, uh, we're all lose a rebuild a village campaign in my district. Uh, we'll start in Randolph, we'll build the models, and we'll be able to replicate this throughout this city. I'll build, what was the village? It's real simple. Neighbors knowing neighbors by name, knowing each other's children's names, and being committed to take care of one another. That's all it was. And we sort of gave license to our neighbors to help us do it. Broke is just gone. And so I've, I've worked towards getting what is now a near zero violent crime rate in the 5th District. It was all five years ago. Those boys owning the corners for the past 10 years, all gone in 15 months, never returned. And Chief Monroe says we did it with minimal arrest. Now the crime rate's creeping back up. It's got everything in the world to do with our civic fabric. We build proper civic fabric around the best interests of, of our children and act accordingly as adults and everything else falls into place. Thank you. Thank you, Council Major. <laughs> and we'll finish uh, with Lee. Go ahead, Lee. Well, I think we all here probably agree. I'm sure agree. We live in a great city. And we've made great strides, particularly when you recognize that for a long time, decades, this city had virtually no population and pretty much no money. And we got into a hole with infrastructure. We got into a hole in a lot of ways. And much ground has been covered. I'm running because I think the pace needs to be picked up there. Um, we've got to improve the schools. We are losing families. We bleed in Woodland Heights every couple of years. 
they go and they leave because of the schools. They leave homes they renovated, homes they love. More than once, I've been with people in tears. They don't want to leave, but they don't feel like they have a choice. And we need to be giving them that choice. We need to build our business community. Um, I've been advocating for aggressive marketing, uh, biomedical, tech industries. They can utilize the existing buildings that we have. They don't need a great deal of space. It doesn't happen by sitting back and waiting for them to find you. Amazon got in Chesterfield County from an aggressive plan. They went after that company and they didn't stop until they got them. And this city needs to be doing that as well. Uh, we need to attract more residents. Businesses will certainly do that, but we need programs. I, I'm a fan of continuing the abatement program. I think it's done wonders with our housing stock. We've got to address the infrastructure. The items that we all complain about, you know, you don't keep that to yourself. We need to address those. I hope you consider supporting me November 6th. I'm not a big talker. I am a big doer. People in Woodland Heights will let you know. We've accomplished a lot there. I want to accomplish that for the rest of the district. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's have a big hand for all of our candidates. Thank you.